this is going to look like a steaming pile of failure. Uh, and when we communicate it to the management, we have to tell them we are doing it for branding purposes. But if we don't do it, we're going to be in a world of trouble. It worked. It helped. Uh, like, guess what? You know, being honest actually helped. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everyone to Prague Marketing Meetup. I am very, very excited today to have Honza Feld here with me. I have been doing marketing for a very long time, but whenever it comes to analytics, I'm working with analytics like 80% of my time, but getting the right number, getting the right data, I'm very, I feel very confident to go and ask Honza about it. And today we are speaking about branding. I hope you are you are spending on uh, branding, and that will be actually my first question. Before we jump into the introduction, we're gonna do the introduction. But how much do you think companies should spend on branding? Okay, thank you for being here. Um, I am very glad to uh, to be able to chat with you all about uh, um, about this marketing subject that's near and dear to my heart, which is, uh, which is uh, obviously branding. Uh, to answer your question, uh, there's, a, there's a really interesting uh, study done by Les Binet and Peter Field. It's called The Long and the Short of It, and there, there they recommend that uh, depending on what brand, uh, whether you are business to business or business to consumer, uh, you should invest about 60 to 70 percent of your marketing budget into uh, into branding and the reason why it's not into performance is uh, it's not that performance is uh, you know somehow sucks or is, is inferior uh, it's because uh, branding can provide long-term gains so I would I would stick with about 60 to 70 percent whenever I've applied this formula to uh, to, to our clients uh, it, it seemed to work for me this is a little bit scary number that I'm gonna spend 70% of my budget into branding something that is very difficult to measure that I know that the return on that investment is not immediate can come back after one year or two years or whatever period it is so for me that's a very scary percentage you are right about uh, about this one because when it comes to uh, when it comes to return on marketing investment, uh, it, it's like branding is notoriously difficult to measure, and the way the the way you should go about it is to look at the uh, look at the trends, look at the uh, look at the increments, and judge your uh, judge your uh, strategies and initiatives based on that. This is a lot about managing expectations because when you uh, when you start talking to uh, start talking to management and when you start talking to people who are uh, who are like uh, your decision makers, your stakeholders, and of course people who uh, who are sitting on your budget, uh, you have to uh, you have to t sort of manage expectations and tell them this is some kind of initiative that's going to take um, two or three years or five years. And we can't evaluate it uh, before then. Uh, so I, I would say that uh, it, it's a, like the, the job of the internal marketer, like among other things, uh, is to sort of communicate that, to communicate the power of the brand to, uh, to your C-level, to your C-suite. That's what we are going to do today. Try to have it as data-driven as it can be branding right yes. but before jumping into that let's have a little bit of an intro you mentioned managing expectations and you're an agency so i would assume that 50 percent of your job is actually to manage expectations <laughs> so uh 75 <laughs> wow all right so cyber food Print. Yes. You are the founder of the of the agency it's based here in Czech Republic. Yes, I am. <laughs> when did that start, and how did you come with come up with this name? <laughs> yeah, the, 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 this has a this has a really weird story because way way back in the days uh, when um, when we had a school project at a, at a university, uh, I, I was looking into this really new thing called WordPress. Okay. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> And we we were starting to, uh, and I thought, hmm, maybe it would be a nice idea to to sort of inflict some of my opinions on the world, uh, and um, you know because whoever wants to know, wants to read them will read them, and I and I started writing about like some really obscure things. Um, 
like marketing, branding, media's role in uh, in the society. Please do not weigh that machine. This stuff. You know, it's, I definitely will try it's, to. <laughs> it's it's it's, uh, it's kind of an interesting retrospective that borderlines with embarrassing. But uh, and I had no idea how to call it. And I and I thought, well, you know, maybe this this is kind of my uh, this is kind of my footprint in uh, in the cyberspace because uh -huh. you know the, the the internet doesn't forget, which we know with all those fun yes. archives, you know. And and yes, this was the as as everybody says, especially those who are elected to uh, elected to the office. You know, we've all made some movies that we're not particularly proud of. <laughs> um, so, but the, but the idea is um, the idea was that we just uh, started working with uh, working with that name, and then uh, then I sort of then I sort of had it as. Um, then I sort of had it as an as an email address, and uh, and it, it just mutated into uh, into an agency because nowadays I'm not actually leaving my own uh, footprint in the cyberspace. I'm, I'm actually helping uh, helping our clients to do that. So it, it's a. Uh, and I would love to. You know, I would love to talk uh, about uh, about purpose and vision and all that stuff. No, we haven't got any of that. <laughs> um, because the, the the idea is like our aim is not to make the world a better place. Like our aim is just to do analytics better, just to do PPC campaigns better, just to help you to do branding a little bit better. This this is it. Like we, we're not saving the whales or human lives here. Like, I'm I'm, uh, I'm purely. Uh, you don't like the whales. Um, <laughs> Actually, I do like the whales, but fuck the orcas. They, they, they are the bullies of the ocean, and they do not deserve any sympathy. I think that um, that would be the headline of this of this episode. <laughs> All right, so let's let's jump right on. So I want to launch my branding campaign, or I want to optimize my branding campaign. Where should I start? Yeah, that's a that, that's a really good question uh, because here, here's the here's the trick. Uh, like all your preparation. Uh, starts way, way, way before you're ready to launch. So think about it this way. Like, th think in terms of, um, don't think in terms of performance, think in terms of media planning and think in, think in terms of various inventories. Like, uh, for example, uh, th th there's a, uh, there's a Google uh, Google inventory. There's this Google Ad Exchange. There, there are various different in inventories under the headings of Xander, Magnite, um, Teeds, all the all the fun uh, like all the fun uh, fun ad exchanges uh, where you can where you can essentially purchase uh, purchase impressions as uh, as, an, as an advertiser. And then uh, you know you have to you have to know where your target audience is. Like where where do they hang out? And if somebody says stuff like cross platform and cross pro uh, and like cross device, yes, it is true. They are cross platform. They are cross device. But you have to you have to be able to sort of locate them. For example, uh, if I want to target uh, travelers or adventure travelers in Teeds, I know that this uh, that this segment has about four million people in the Czech Republic. So chances are that some, that, a, that a certain proportion of my target audience is going to be hanging out in that inventory. Mm -hmm. um, you then have you can then run all sorts of fun things or fun analyses regarding segment overlap. Mm -hmm. To do that, I highly recommend like buying master data from Adform, and uh, because with, uh, without this uh, without this type of technology, you, you're not going to be able to piece those um, individual uh, you know puzzle bits together. So. So uh, that comes that sort of circles back to the uh, to the point. Find out where they hang out, uh, and once uh, once you know that, uh, once you know who you want to target, once you know um, what inventory you want to target, uh, then it's time for some uh, for some light market research. Uh, and the best way to uh, the best way to do this is set up um, a quarterly or biannual brand tracking. It's kind of a big survey that, uh, that, uh, that looks at your brand attributes, that looks at your message salience, that looks at your, um, looks, uh, at your competition, etc. Et and you can, you can then just use the data from, from that big brand survey and I mean, use it to fuel it your, inf uh, your information. What do you use for this kind of surveys? I was speaking about offline surveys or something on your website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is uh, this is uh, this is stuff uh, where you have to where you have to start connecting data from uh, either online panels like uh, European national panels, send, uh, and things uh, things like that. Um, usually, you can uh, you can get it uh, if you do if you do market research with uh, with companies like uh, Response Now 
Behavior, Kantar, um, they can give you the raw data. They can mm -hmm. even, some can give, even give you the cookie identifiers, mm -hmm. which is like mighty fine. Mm -hmm. But the uh, but the trick is uh, those are the, those are data that are uh, that are sort of collected from online panels, mm -hmm. um, sometimes online, sometimes offline. It's it, it's kind of you know it, it could be a mixture of mm -hmm. uh, it could be a mixture of both, and uh, so yeah, one, you have to you have to sort of collect that, uh, do the market research, and find out uh, what is, what it sort of tells you. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't do uh, quarterly or biannual brand tracking, uh, you can then you can then try uh, pre-testing or post-testing. So you run uh, you run a test on your uh, on your target audience before you run the campaign, and then you test uh, then you run the campaign, and then you run another test on the same target audience after you will have run the campaign. So what kind of tests are we speaking about? Uh, th this is uh, this is essentially uh, this depends on the objectives of the campaign. So if you want to if you want to um, look at uh, uh, for example brand awareness. Uh, prompted and unprompted recall and things you know all the fun things like that uh, that uh, that should be uh, that should be in the brief that goes into the market research agency mm -hmm. um, if you want to look at uh, if you want to look at product recall or message salience or to what extent your product fits the characteristics of um, of your brand uh, that should be uh, that should be a slightly different objective but still it should be in the brief in uh, for your uh, for your marketing uh, research agency just to sum it up the first step will be as usual in any marketing activity define the target audience yes. that's definitely <laughs> going to be the first step but including in that what you mentioned was the media inventory. So not only identifying who is your target audience, but identifying how how many of the target audience you can actually target with whatever media you're going to use. Exactly. Finding out uh, what's the market potential, and that is uh, this takes work. It takes a lot of uh, it takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of effort to to, to actually sort of find that out because it, and it's the it's the step that gets forgotten about the most. Mm -hmm. Like very few people think, I mean, or very few marketers think, okay, we should uh, we should target uh, target I don't know uh, business travelers uh, between somewhere between forty to fifty five years old who want to travel with uh, with a luxury airline. So let's find them on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay. it's like yes, you you strictly speaking can do that. But it's a horrible mismatch in terms of context and in terms of uh, in terms of um, uh, knowing how your message is going to be consumed. You know, one of the ways that's going to be considerably more efficient or more effective is just you know talk to these people, look at uh, look at your internal databases, run your databases uh, through uh, through a prediction model, and say, okay, these are the people who are likely to be upgrading within five years. Mm -hmm. And then start targeting them with banner ads, video ads, hell, you maybe even on LinkedIn. But don't expect the return on investment to be like right now. Mm -hmm. So, defining target audience, defining market potential, and going with the market research, potentially with a market research agency who can run the surveys for you, or they already have the data that can provide for you, and defining your goals for. This, this branding campaign. And you listed several kind of goals. Like, I'm gonna give an example of, for, for me, for example. I'm, we are working at Datadoo, we are a software platform. When I'm running a branding campaign, and we are still a startup, what goals should I be focusing on? First of all, you need to reach as many people as you can. Like, you need, you need to tell them that you exist. And then you are actually, uh, then you are. Then you need to tell them that you're better than someone else, right? Um, software companies, or, or particularly software products, they uh, they are challenged by other software products, and then by um, then by some consultants who keep telling marketers that they don't need software products. Yeah. You know, and 
you know, in some cases, you know, data integration, yes, it might it might be redundant, but the but the problem is that like if you haven't got it by now, uh, you've got way more problems than you than you thought. You know, <laughs> so yeah. um, so most of the time, uh, most of the time, it's a uh, it's a problem of, uh, of sort of being distinctive and of being differentiated. Yeah. So. What I would do is, uh, I would say, all right, uh, first two years, we're going to we're going to make sure that uh, X amount of people knows about you. Mm -hmm. So that uh, so the so the KPIs, the the objectives that I would uh, that I would sort of uh, optimize for, would be brand awareness. Uh, it would be brand recall, and that is prompted or unprompted. Uh, it would be uh, it would be also. Um, Making sure that uh, that people remember your tagline, um, uh, and making sure that they can uh, that they can sort of fit you into the right category. Mm -hmm. Your case particularly, I I would just go wide. Mm -hmm. I would say, all right, and, and it, it it sounds like super dumb. It sounds unsophisticated. It sounds like you know you, you didn't have to go to school for this. Um, you know, we're going to uh, like our target audience is everybody that's that's able to buy from us. Well, really, um, no. But but the but the idea is that uh, that branding goals are slightly different than uh, than performance based goals. Um, in, in performance, you optimize for for ROMI, you optimize for ROI, uh, return on ad spend, all the uh, all these fun things. Uh, in branding, you are making sure that the top of the funnel that you draw from in performance campaigns doesn't dry up. Mm -hmm. It's it's a completely different ball game. Yeah, and I think yeah, well, the, the example that you gave that the well is gonna dry. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can go into lead generation, but you need enough enough um, uh, lead uh, on top of that funnel. This is one of the things that you know. If, if you're running a startup and you go to the investor and tell them, "Listen, mate, we need about uh, five to fifty million uh, crowns annually to tell people that we exist, and we're going to need this for about five years." <laughs> uh, chances are that everybody who, like every single investor who's oriented uh, on you know compound annual growth rate and uh, and making sure that they uh, that they are able to sort of uh, sell your share to um, in in the next series of funding uh, they they're just going to go what are you, are you mental so no like if you want the company to survive for those 5 years uh, and not be on life support and if you want it to thrive after 5 years uh, this is what you like this is essentially what you have to do right there's uh, the study um, that that I previously mentioned the long and the short of it uh, it, it sort of deals with um, uh, it deals with share of market and share of voice and um, if your uh, if your share of voice goes up your share of market is going to go up but it's going to happen in a different date range and that's the problem you you need to you need to learn to shift those date ranges and you need to learn to communicate these expectations because the because the trick is that sometimes you you just might um you might run a fundamentally successful campaign but it's not it, it seems like it's not going uh, it's not going anywhere it's not it hasn't got any impact on sales and you kind of don't know what's going on and then about two years later, uh, when you when somebody from your sales team follows up with uh, uh, follows up with a lead, uh, and, and and asks him, hey, so how did you come across us? And that fellow that fellow says, you know, I remember that dancing gorilla that you had that you had in your campaign. And the sales guy goes, Jesus, that was like what five years ago. What happened? Uh, and and, and this, this is, these are like the little tiny gimmicks that we need to pay attention yeah, to. Yeah, this is the thing that many people miss when it comes to performance and branding, that branding has a huge effect on performance. Like, I'm not sure if I remember the, the, the numbers correctly, but brands with a good brand awareness, they have eight times better conversion rate. Not because of the copy is better, like they perform as ads, they don't have a better copy, they don't have a better visual. They just have a better brand which have, they have been building over, as you said, three, four, five, ten 10 years. And that branding helped them to boost their conversion rate. And that's, that's what you need at the end of the day. You are looking at performance, you need looking at how many customers do you get, how many products are you selling, and branding has this direct effect when you convert, as you like, remember this crazy gorilla dancing five years ago. It, this is already has already <laughs> jumped your conversion rate. Like that leads already speaking with you. He's wanna buy from you just because of that branding campaign. 
Yeah, that, that, that is absolutely correct. And and as I said, it it, it works within uh, it works within a slightly different time frame. So um, yeah, I, and and we've done that. Uh, like I I don't I would love to show like the, <laughs> the numbers, but I don't particularly fancy seeing myself in court for breaching <laughs> uh, breaching NDAs. So um, okay, we do definitely that. want that. Like yeah, we want to learn more from you. What we did was uh, we ran a we ran a campaign, and. Before we even ran it, uh, we had the data from uh, we had the data from market research. We had the data from you know, from brand surveys. We had the data from the uh, internal database. We had access to Google Analytics. We had access to um, to Exponia yeah, and it, essentially to to every single you know utility known to man. Um, and we thought, and and before we, before we started it, we, we thought, well, okay, this might be a this might be kind of challenging because um, we are hitting the efficiency ceiling in in our PPC campaigns. So, you know, judging by the law of diminishing marginal utility, uh, you might have a problem there <laughs> when you when you decide to uh, when you decide to uh, to invest a lot more money into uh, into a channel that might necessarily not yield the right amount of. Um, the right amount of um, you know, of conversions. So essentially, what uh, what we did was you know, something unprecedented, and we thought, um, listen, let's just do the let's just do the branding thing. Let's let's run display ads. Let's uh, let's optimize for for widening of the for widening of the top of the funnel, and and we did exactly that. And every single week of that campaign. We looked at it, and uh, in terms of performance metrics, like from conversion rate, cost per acquisition, uh, uh, spend, uh, traffic, it looked absolutely god awful. <laughs> Like every, if you showed those numbers to every performance marketer, every single one of them would go, stop the campaign, bury the results, don't tell anybody. You know? um, and we thought, well, no, we're going to wait. It's like, for how long are you going to continue this madness? And we did for about half a year. Wow. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and, then, and then, we, then we finally ran out of budget and, uh, and we thought, all right, so it's time to, uh, it's time to look, at, uh, look at what it did. Uh, as it turns out, we, we actually saw, uh, and because this was like a very highly product-oriented campaign, we saw the lift in um, organic search, in paid search for brand queries, mm -hmm. and we saw the uh, and we saw the boost in direct traffic. So there's no, the, you know, when I when I looked at it, I thought, mm, okay, then there, there might be something to it. So uh, so we stuck with it for uh, so we stuck with it for uh, for another year. And now the client is really happy about this. <laughs> so um, I'm surprised you managed to keep the client until you reached that point. So good job in there. You know what? So am I. <laughs> but you know, somehow, somehow, I guess it worked because and and, and then what really helped was uh, just being upfront with them, saying, "Listen, this is going to look like a steaming pile of failure." Uh, and when we communicate it to the management, we have to tell them we are doing it for branding purposes. But if we don't do it, we're going to be in a world of trouble. Um, and it, it it worked. It helped. Uh, like, guess what? You know, being honest actually helped. <laughs> <laughs> That's surprising. That's surprising. Uh, so yeah, I think it takes us back to managing expectations. I think it's a very important part of any marketers. No matter what level you are, uh, you need to understand and learn this skill. Uh, all right. So let's go back to to our steps on managing these branding campaigns. So. We identified the target audience. We identified the market potential. We set our goals for this branding campaign, which is way different than any um, uh, uh, any performance campaign. And we did the market research. Mm -hmm. What's next? And then you start I mean, looking at your KPIs because chances are that as a marketer, you've got some KPIs in one way or another, you know, like in one way, shape, or form. Uh, you have to uh, you have to uh, sort of justify your existence really so um, so so we take a look we take a look at that and we uh, and we go all right um, we know that this year we have to tell about two million people that we exist 
Uh, so that's the that's the target. And I can uh, make sure that uh, make sure that uh, about two million people know about us, and uh, or maybe your uh, or maybe your uh, your KPI is to boost uh, prompted recall by thirty percent, etc. Uh, or to, uh, or you can uh, you can say all right for for this campaign we need to uh, we need to boost the the brand salience I, I mean the message salience of the, of our branding campaign uh, can be like a tagline or something like something of that sort by X percent and based on that you uh, you find out all right uh, how much uh, like you start looking at uh, you start looking at audience uh, like audience penetration, um, like how many people of that given inventory of that given target audience you want to actually hit. So like is it ten percent, fifty percent, seventy five percent, all that? You you, you just uh, you just count with uh, you just count backwards to uh, to to hit your uh, to hit your goals. Once you've got that. You have to uh, you have to find out um, with what ad frequency you are actually working. Um, when it comes to branding campaigns, I highly recommend working with ad frequencies above five, uh, because and, and I'm quite sure that that somebody's going to post in the comments uh, a link to to an article from um, I don't know WordStream or some something of that sort uh, that says um, that your click through rate goes down after uh, after the frequency hits seven and stuff like that. Yeah, okay, that's. That is true. That's that's absolutely perfect. But we don't give a rat's ass about uh, about click through rate because what we care about is <laughs> guess what viewable impressions, recall, and making sure that you are memorable. So the top of mind or share of mind or you know, however you call it, um, those are the uh, those are the main metrics that we're optimizing about, uh, for. So. Once you've got that, uh, you uh, once you've estimated the ad frequency, uh, you, you can uh, and and you can do that in a, in a multitude of ways. You can just um, test. You can look at your your historical data. You can uh, you can get different benchmarks from different vendors. You can uh, you can commission an independent market survey. Sure, there are, there are tons of these things. But I would recommend like start with uh, start with uh, with five uh, or above five. Work your way up. Ideal, ideally, it's somewhere between uh, seven, uh, like somewhere between five to seven. Um, if you are a B two B brand, don't be afraid of, uh, of double digit numbers. Like ten to twelve is completely all right. This term is being thrown out uh, a lot right now. Ad fatigue. So, when do you think people start getting tired of seeing this image, or seeing this video, or seeing this dancing gorilla? When do you think should be the limit, and when should ah, yeah. change that visual? Ad, ad blindness and ad fatigue; uh, th th those are like beautiful constructs, um, but I I'm I'm not really sure that they that they mean a lot, you know? <laughs> because the, the, because the trick is that uh, actually it's the uh, if you look at uh, if you look at Coca Cola, the, that's a really terrible example, by the way. Um, but uh, but the point is that. Um, you know, you can't you can't sort of compare uh, SMEs, uh, corporations to to, to a multi-billion uh, multinational firm. But there's among all the smart things they do, one of them is they run the same Christmas ad every single year. Why do they do that? Is it because they are nostalgic? No, it's because it works. Um, example from the Czech market: uh, that there's a there's a Christmas ad for Kefola, uh, the, and we run it all the time. Uh, there's the the same thing for uh, in in the UK for John Lewis. Um, the trick is that if you uh, I don't think that uh, and evidence uh, f doesn't seem to suggest that ad fatigue is. I mean, it, it might be real, but it's inconsequential when it comes to branding and building mental availability. Uh, I'm throwing a lot of different terms here, uh, but if you've read How Brands Grow by Brian Sharp, or any uh, study from the Ehrenberg Bass Institute, uh, they uh, they specialize in uh, in like finding evidence in uh, in marketing. Like they they are applying hard science into uh, to marketing, and th they found that paradoxically. Uh, all the uh, all the brands that don't change their creative 
they have much better branding, much better brand recall, much better message salience. And that is because they don't change, they don't rebrand. Uh, it's, it's the one thought that gets repeated that sticks. Um, I mean, one of my uh, one of my um, pet peeves was uh, uh, was when uh, when social bakers uh, rebranded. You know, if you think about it, you, you just look at it and go, "What the hell? Why?" Um, you know, you, you have this. Uh, yeah, it's a startup that uh, that's been leveraged to no end. But yeah, it's a company that uh, that works that has uh, and that has built uh, a pretty decent brand of, you know, around the globe, but. Uh, but now they they have rebranded into something else. Amplify. Uh, Amplify. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and and all that brand equity that that was there just goes out of the window. It's it's kind of shame to, to sort of um, discard years of uh, like years of branded cam uh, like years of campaigns for that. On the other hand, when you have the when you have that merger, uh, in, it's it's on the Czech market. The merger between Generali and the Czech insurance company, that's kind of a stroke of uh, a stroke of genius because you have a you have a big local player connecting with a big global player. Um, it makes sense that uh, it makes sense that Generali sort of. As a brand, from from the branding perspective, I'm not saying from from the sales perspective, from uh, from like customer confusion perspective, etc., etc. You know, but but the trick is that you know you have a you have a local player that's being swallowed up by a global brand that has hundreds of years of tradition. It works. It's going to work. Like they, they, plus, they've got more money in their marketing budgets than God, so uh, they're gonna make it work. But uh, but the but the idea is that it it, it works because because these things uh, these things merge. You are merging um, a, a player with good brand equity uh, into a player with a great brand equity. This is amazing. Um, with social bakers and Amplify, uh, you merging uh, you merging a player with good brand equity into into a player with well, I don't know how known is Amplify. <laughs> I, I didn't hear about them before. I know they're a big I know they're a big company, like I mean they're definitely um, uh, doing pretty well, but before that acquisition I, I never heard be, uh, about them before. Yeah. Uh, so it, in, I might not be their target audience, that might be the reason, but still. So in, in terms of branding Yeah. yeah. So I think that the, the bottom line here is the simple rule which is if it's not broken don't fix it. So if you have a campaign, you have a campaign which is performing very well. And when you say performing, performing in, in your KPIs for that branding, so it's performing from a branding point of view. If it's performing well, just keep it running. One, two, ten years as like learning from bigger brands, you already spend a lot of time and a lot of money to create this amazing campaign and it's working. Just keep it running. Yes, keep it. Maybe, uh, maybe like switch up. Uh, you, you can switch out, and, uh, switch up the key messages if you, uh, if you, uh, if you need to position your brand uh, slightly differently this year uh, or within the next five years. And think about it. Like I, I'm talking in years. I'm not talking in weeks or months. Like you, you need to start thinking in in that time frame as well. <laughs> All right. So let's go back to the short time frame. We decided on the ad frequency. You mentioned the sweet spot of seven, seven mm -hmm. times. Uh, for B2B, don't be afraid to go up to 10 and 12. What's next? Sure. Well, and then you then you look at the then you look at the viewability of your format. Like uh, how many? Uh, like what's the what's the percentage of viewable impressions that you might get for your money? Right. Um, some uh, some uh, inventories they have the, the viewability of twenty percent. Some of forty percent. Uh, some like particularly premium inventories they might have uh, the viewability of uh, of like uh, over over sixty percent. Right. Once you uh, once you have uh, once you've got that, uh, you you essentially use just then just simple maths and you you figure out uh, for this budget uh, if we want to reach this amount of uh, I mean this percentage of our target audience within. Uh, Within that inventory, um, how many view with that frequency? How many viewable impressions do we have to serve? Now we have the viewability of it, uh, of those of those impressions. So we then uh, we then calculate how many impressions we actually have to serve, and then we just run it. We run the campaign, optimize the hell out of it.
optimize the hell out of it. <laughs> yes. How the hell do you do that? <laughs> okay, so, uh, th th this is uh, this gets really simple. Uh, it, it, it's uh, a, a lot of uh, like a lot of agencies turn uh, turn this into uh, the, like this mystical uh, <laughs> uh, mystical art. Uh, it's it's essentially about uh, monitoring uh, monitoring the placements. Making sure that you that you are hitting the uh, that you are hitting the viewability score, making sure that you don't um, you don't show up on websites where your client doesn't want you to show up, uh, making sure that uh, that the that the formats and the and the line items and the creatives that uh, that actually have the uh, have the best performance that they uh, they have enough money in their budget to uh, to deliver this uh, this above par um, um, results. It's just making sure that uh, that your ads are seen and they are interacted with and they show up in the right places for the right price. Back to the our steps you mentioned, going back to the market research to evaluate mm -hmm. your performance for the branding campaign. Yes. What do you look at? Yes, you essentially look at incremental increase in your KPIs. Uh, and then, and it really, really depends how you look at it, because uh, there, there are several ways of going about it. One of them is to measure the delta between uh, between the the last market research and this market research, which you know, you know, to, to me as a as a data orientated person, it feels kind of iffy. But you can do that. Um, the the other way of going about it is you can measure uh, you can measure the start attempting to measure causality. And for that, there is something called causal impact. It's been, it's been, um, it's been created by Google, and these fellows know what they are doing because they are essentially telling you, you give us two different, uh, two different ranges, you give us a set, give us a predictor, give us, a, uh, give us your data that, you, that you're testing against the predictor, and we're going to tell you Where's the uh, where's the causality be, uh, between these two? Uh, like whether there's a causality there, and chances are that it's it, it's like not really um, it's it's not um, complicated uh, with Python and R. You can you can easily find out um, find out the packages for it. You can download it, install it, toss it on your data science team. Where it gets really difficult is thinking about um, is essentially thinking about the uh, the data collection, the data uh, data purity uh, before you even start looking at evaluation, before you even start looking at the campaigns, because you you've got to have like a really well optimized data collection on your website. You have to have. Uh, you, like you have to be a data mature company to um, to sort of pull this off, and that and that's not uh, that's not like super easy. So so yeah, the the, the problem isn't in the technology. Uh, the problem is in the uh, is in the mindset. You mentioned being a data mature company, and that is not about the technology, but you still need the technology. You still need the tools that helps you to be data mature. What is your what is your arsenal? What do you use to go through these well, minor ten steps that we true, spoke about? True. Uh, you do need a certain uh, certain level of uh, of maturity. You do need a certain a certain amount of tools that that are going to help you in this endeavor. Uh, and and in in this case, uh, like our our stack is that. We use uh, either Response Now or Behavio uh, or uh, Kanta uh, for market research. Um, then, when it comes to when it comes to the uh, to ad serving itself, then uh, almost any DSP that allows you to look at uh, that allows you to look at raw data or look at logs can do. Uh, we do. We work mostly with Adform, but I'm quite sure that you can you, know, you can work with Media Mouth, Xander, Teeds, um, Google DV360. You know, if you've got a budget for for DV360, then chances are that you know you you kind of set when when it comes to when it comes to branding. So um, so yeah, this this that's for programmatic display. Uh, when it comes to viewability, always measure according to IAB or according to MRC. Uh, this is. Uh, but if possible, have a set of more stringent criteria developed for yourself. You know, like the, 
because uh, because like even though these standards are very good, they are not end all to be all. So yeah, that's uh, so, so, so that's that. Then we use R or Python for uh, for causal impact. And when uh, when we work with uh, when we work with uh, data from uh, from the uh, from different sources, then then we uh, we kind of rely on Kabula, Python, Google Cloud Function, and BigQuery. And you forgot data do. Yeah, 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 I haven't used it yet, but very soon. <laughs> uh, and uh, and then uh, to visualize all that data, uh, it's uh, it's either Power BI or Tableau, and that's 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 essentially yes, like it, it's. Uh, it's it feels almost trivial, you know. Like data scientists are gonna look in look at this and go, oh, Jesus, this is, this is easy. Like I can I can do that in my sleep. But yeah, the problem is that the data scientists can do that in, uh, the technical portion, but they can't do the the branding portion. And when you show the uh, when you show the branding uh, when you show the data science portion to the branding people, they just go, what the hell is that? <laughs> it, it, it just looks like disaster on wheels. Like I, I don't understand any of this shit. So you know, the, the the problem is that you know, it, it kind of comes back to working together um, very very closely and I gotta tell you like it, it, it's it's much easier to outsource one of these things or both of these things to somebody who actually knows how to do this so yeah that there goes my bit of shameless self-promotion <laughs> but uh, uh, but yeah I, I mean sometimes it's uh, sometimes it's like extraordinarily odd to make sure that uh, that the marketing team or and the ID team uh, cooperate I have one last question about applying that for smaller companies who have smaller budgets. But before get getting into the question, just remind everyone, please subscribe to the YouTube channel and definitely join our Facebook group just to speak with everyone in uh, the Brock Marketing Meetup. And thank you, you Hansa, very much. I will find you. <laughs> <laughs> he knows how to do it. <laughs> so thank you, Honza, very much for being here. I'm not letting you go yet. We still have one last question in, in a very short way. I don't think we have a lot of time. How can a small company with a smaller budget, we don't have the budget to go for a research uh, agency to do all of that. How can we do that on a smaller budget, just in a smaller way? Okay. Yeah, no, when, it comes to, when it comes to the smaller scale, this gets super super tricky and it, it, it just comes back to uh, it just comes back to leveraging your persuasive talents <laughs> when it comes to talking to investors like it, it, you, you just have to manage expectations but the uh, the idea is um, you know if you if you're a small brand I would suggest uh, shifting the frame of reference because the the, the current frame of reference is um, if you want to uh, if we want to be here in five years we need to start doing branding now. If we want to make sure that we are able to sell the company in five years and then just burn it to the ground, uh, everything be damned, then we need to do lots of performance. And I'm not trying to sort of dunk on performance here. I'm, I'm just saying that these are two different, like different tools for different purposes. And, you know, well executed performance may build brand but it's but we know that it's the other way around as well well executed branding not may but definitely will build performance so it's just taking taking the longer view than the next quarter or next year so i i would suggest that like i i know that this is not what you want to hear but but it's what you damn well need to hear <laughs> i think one example i always give when it comes to branding is airbnb uh the they had, I don't know exactly what were the percentage, but I would assume something about 60, 70% is spent on brand versus performance. And came Corona and they had their um, uh, competing with uh, Booking.com and Expedia and they just, they're just doing great. Like they one of the almost only tourism or hospitality brand that was doing very well during Corona. And they attributed all of that just because they were serving the brand, they were very true to the brand. And right after when I think I read an article that said, okay, like, fuck this, we're gonna spend, I don't know, like 99% of our um, uh, advertising or budget only on brand. And they launched right away their, uh, their first video, uh, their TV ad, uh, I think. So I think that's a very good case on point, uh, yeah, let's say. In, in terms of startups, like Airbnb completely killed it with their branding. So yeah. yes, do that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, do, do Airbnb. Be Airbnb. Uh, thank you, Monza, very much, and I'm sure I want to um, host you again because you have a lot of a lot of um, uh, knowledge that I want to learn uh, from, and I'm sure um, uh, 
the audience and the the, the meetup and the community want to learn from you as well. I just have a lot of weird ideas and somehow they work. I don't, I don't know. But thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'd love to see you again. Thank you very much.